Hello and welcome to the Beat Cancer Answer, brought to you by BeatCancer.org, the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education. We believe that 90% of all cancers could be eliminated through environmental and lifestyle choices alone, and science agrees. Unfortunately, most people don't know it, so we provide the education that can help you prevent, cope with, and beat cancer through diet, lifestyle, and other immune-boosting approaches. On every podcast, we will feature an expert who can teach us how to become part of that 90% who could prevent getting diagnosed with cancer. If you already have cancer, we have empowering information for you too. Over the past 35 years, we have helped thousands of cancer patients get back into the driver's seat when it comes to their personal journey of healing cancer and preventing future reoccurrence. Eddie Miller, host of the Ask the Expert Teleseminar series, interviews Susan Silberstein on the dangers of genetically modified organisms, GMOs. Miller formerly served as board chair of BeatCancer.org and chief operating officer of the National Foundation for Alternative Medicine. This is Eddie Miller, host of Ask the Expert Teleseminar series, and tonight I have my good friend and, and mentor, Susan Silberstein, on the line with us. And we're here this evening talking about how safe are genetically modified foods. For those of you who may not know me, um, I have worked with Susan for several years on the board at the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education, uh, BeatCancer.org. And also, uh, I'm an author, and my new book, Living Inside Out, the go-to guide for the overwhelmed, overworked, and overcommitted, will be out in the next few months. Uh, You're welcome to go to my website, eddiemiller.com and download uh, six chapters of my new book for free. Uh, be more than happy to send that to you. And tonight, as I said, we have my, my good, good friend, Susan Silberstein, and I'm speaking with Susan. She's the founder and director of BeatCancer.org. Susan is an international speaker on nutrition and cancer prevention, prevention author of the books Hungry for Health and Hungrier for Health, and the originator of the Beat Cancer series. Susan, uh, you know, you've been a passionate advocate for health and nutrition for over three deca- decades. I've known you for at least one of those. So please share with everyone what motivates you. Eddie, as many of our listeners may already know, uh, my first husband died a horrible death from cancer uh, at the age of 30. Actually, he died more particularly from his treatments than from the disease. But uh, that tragedy inspired me, like many people who get inspired from tragedy, uh, to want to make a difference for others. And so at the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education, which I founded back in 1977, we have happily made a huge difference uh, in the last three decades uh, for a lot of people, especially for families with young children uh, who now have a one in two lifetime risk of cancer, and that hits home because I was left with two infants when he died. So I've been working my whole life to protect their health as well as that of other people's children. Well, and and when I met Susan well over 10 years ago, I I don't remember the exact date, but uh, when I met Susan, uh, I immediately fell in love with her passion and the 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 work of BeatCancer.org and all the services that they that they provide. And so, Susan, for those who may not know who are on the phone, can you just share a little bit about the services that the center provides? For sure. We are a not-for-profit, and uh, we specialize in uh, cancer coaching and referrals. We provide nutritional and psychological and immunological and other non-toxic resources, uh, whether it be for cancer prevention or prevention of recurrence or for supporting a cancer patient during, after, or or even instead of conventional treatment. And uh, I guess over the last 30-some years, we've trained about 50,000 prevention seekers. We've educated thousands of healthcare professionals. And we have provided uh, individualized consultations by telephone to nearly 30,000 cancer patients, all on a donation basis. That's that is fantastic, and um, you know when I met Susan, I was working with the National Foundation for Alternative Medicine in Washington, and Susan clearly 
uh, of all the time that I've known her is the top uh, cancer prevention and nutrition educator who has some very strong opinions about genetically modified foods. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I so, do. Susan, share with everyone exactly what are genetically modified foods. Well, these are foods which um, come from genetically modified organisms. What we mean by that is specific changes have been introduced artificially into their DNA by techniques known as genetic engineering techniques. And what happens is that uh, scientists insert the genes of one species into the DNA of a totally unrelated species. It's kind of the a uh, human manipulation of an organism's genetic material, but it doesn't occur naturally that way. We have to do it artificially. Um, and we started this back in the 1970s, starting with genetically engineered bacteria. Then we graduated to mice uh, uh, a year or so later. And finally, uh, genetically modified foods hit the market in the early 1990s. So from the perspective of, of all the, the, the scientific research behind it what, it, what are they saying are the main advantages to, to genetically modified crops? Well, it depends from which vantage point you look. The idea is that it's supposed to be uh, economically uh, valuable uh, because if GM crops are resilient to diseases and presumably climate change and drought, uh, then those are the two main reasons why we would have poor crop yields all over the world. And so if we have better crop yields, we're going to be able to better meet the uh, nutritional needs of malnourished populations. Unfortunately, uh, there are actually uh, rather questionable advantages here um, because the uh, largest study in the world that has dealt with whether GM foods can actually eradicate world hunger, and this, this study included over 400 scientists. It was put together by the UN. Um, and the conclusion of this uh, international assessment uh, committee found that there was practically no evidence supporting that genetically and genetic engineering was actually going to help with world hunger. And, and one of the points they made, and rightfully so, we still have plenty of poverty and hunger, uh, uh, poverty induced hunger right here in the U.S., despite the fact that we use genetically modified uh, foods more than any other country. So we're not sure that it's really accomplishing uh, what it said it was setting out to do uh, in terms of being a solution to the world hunger crisis and climate change. So then, in your opinion, would you say that the disadvantages outweigh the advantages? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I that think... That was the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we can fool Mother Nature, but I think the joke is on us. Um, because what we're doing is manipulating genes that, in ways that nature didn't do. Um, and in the process, we're creating uh, allergenic and toxic and even carcinogenic side effects. So we're producing these proteins with weird traits like herbicide and pesticide tolerance and the ability to produce excess pesticides. Um, so th this is this is really scary. Um, there's a great book that I recommend people read, written by Jeffrey Smith, called Genetic Roulette, and in it he documents about 65 different health risks of genetically engineered foods. Um, and so I think everybody ought to read that. And here, listen to what he says. He says, there's only two reasons why plants are genetically engineered, either to allow them to drink poison or produce poison. Yeah. And he says the poison drinkers, we call them herbicide tolerant because they're uh, outfitted with genes that allow them to survive otherwise deadly doses of toxic herbicides. 
Then there's the poison producers. They're the BT crops. Uh, crops. BT um, stands for a certain kind of bacillus, a microorganism that can kill insects. That sounds good if you're producing uh, crops. Um, and But this uh, type of uh, genetic uh, modification produces a pesticide internally in every single cell of the plant. So this BT is thousands of times more concentrated than it would be if you were just spraying the pesticide onto the crop, which is bad enough. So, uh, so the this is pretty itself. scary stuff as far as I'm concerned. Right, and it's, and it's actually within the plant itself. It's a natural uh, component of that plant. A mini pesticide factory in the plant that could ultimately produce a mini pesticide factory in our intestines. Right, right. So what are the most genetically co contaminated food crops? Uh, soy, corn, uh, cottonseed, canola, um, summer squashes, tomatoes, potatoes, peas, um, papaya coming from Hawaii, and now lately sugar beets have just been authorized. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the research. Um, I know you you're, you love research, and so is there any specific research on the dangerous effects of the genetic modification on, on these crops? And you mentioned soy and corn. Can you speak directly about them? Yes, and I'd say most of the uh, research is, is animal research at this point. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, uh, rats and mice that have been fed genetically modified soy uh, had lower birth weights than non-GMO soy consumers. Their sperm was damaged. Uh, uh, their, they had testicular damage, and in general, reproductive ability was damaged <clears throat> and um, also increased mortality. Uh, a, there was a Russian study found that over 55% of the newborn uh, baby rats uh, that were fed GM soy died within three weeks of birth, but the non-GM soy babies, um, only 9% of them died as opposed to close to 56%. Um, also, 36% of the rats in the GM group were underweight, but only 6.7% of the non-genetically modified soy animals were underweight. They also had liver and pancreatic problems, and uh, we also saw um, uh, damage in rabbit organs as well from genetically modified soy. Now, the, the corn uh, is also a problem. Um, rats that were fed genetically modified corn that was absolutely approved for human consumption developed liver and kidney toxicities uh, in particular, but they also had uh, heart problems, adrenal problems, uh, problems in their spleens, and in general, uh, problems with their blood cells. Um, Mice-fed GM corn had fewer and smaller babies than non-GM uh, corn-fed mice. Pigs and cows became sterile from genetically modified corn. Uh, in Germany and the Philippines, GM corn caused the death of buffaloes, cows, horses, and poultry. Wow. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You, yeah. And so let's. I know we're going to get to the the positive side of this. Um, oh yeah, we have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, and and that's the intention of 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 this tele seminar. But let let's also you had mentioned cottonseed and canola crops. So yeah. share with us what you found about those as well, please. Um, well, for example, you know, the cottonseed plant uh, is uh, uh, subject to attack by weevils. Um, so when they modify the cotton plant to resist the weevils, they also found that monarch butterflies wouldn't go near that plant. Um, in India, uh, buffalo that uh, were 
uh, eating uh, genetically modified cotton seed had reproductive complications and infertility and thousands of sheep died in the US pigs became sterile or they actually gave birth to bags of water um, they also developed uh, sheep developed uh, enlarged bile ducts and severe intestinal irritations which ultimately killed them um, and so <laughs> this is this is serious business i'm i'm really very much concerned and canola is another story because um uh, about 80% of all the acres of canola plants are genetically modified and um the uh, there were uh, a number of uh, common herbicides uh, particularly uh, roundup by monsanto that um actually uh became they produced mutant superweeds uh when they they used the genetic modification of the canola plants uh, canola seeds so that um the the seeds were resistant to the herbicides and they spawned mutant superweeds that were also resistant to herbicides that are totally uncontrollable. Also, we saw that that rats that were fed genetically modified canola developed very heavy livers. Now, when an organ gets heavy, um, it is because it's overworking. It hypertrophies. The body, in its natural wisdom will lay down more tissue for an overworked organ in order to give it a chance to do a job more efficiently. But when the liver is overworked, that is not a good thing because our livers produce hundreds of different biological activities in our body and a toxic liver cannot detoxify a toxic body. Mm-hmm. So, as we focus in on our own bodies and, and ourselves as beings, uh, what, like, what particular concerns do you have, as you mentioned, with soy, corn, and canola as it regards our health? I think it's the fact that they're so ubiquitous. They are literally everywhere in prepared and processed foods, especially their oils. We hear about corn oil and soy oil and canola oil. I mean, you could almost not buy anything that has been prepared that is um, lacking in, in those oils. And here's my main concern about the oils. Pesticides are lipophilic. So they're going to hang around in the fats, in the oils. And that way we're going to get even a heavier concentration than we might otherwise get in a genetically modified food. Wow. I mean, it's it, you know, you pick up a package of anything. It's either got soy oil or corn oil or canola oil or some other derivative of those foods. And those directly are, are within those oils and the fats. There can, those pesticides have no other option but to c- connect. They hang in there. They, they don't process out. Right. So <clears throat> I know that processed foods often have hidden genetic modified sources. What specific ingredients should we watch out for? Yes, um, uh, so obviously anything that says it's got canola oil or soy oil or corn oil, for sure. But now, here's something. If you buy something that says uh, sugar is an ingredient, but it doesn't specify that it is pure cane sugar, then it's definitely going to be at least a combination of sugar beet, beet sugar, as well as uh, sugar cane. And now sugar beets are, as I said, approved for genetic modification, so we're going to have that problem. Anything that's got baking powder in it, uh, not only corn oil, but corn sugar, corn syrup, corn starch, corn meal, anything that's got food starch or modified food starch, if you see fructose as an ingredient or gluten as an ingredient, hydrolyzed vegetable protein or texturized vegetable protein, malt or maltodextrin, uh, not only soy oil, but soy protein, soy 
protein isolate, soy sauce, certainly soy milk or tamari, um, anything that just says vegetable oil, look out for that. And even whey and whey powder, you are not 100% guaranteed that you're going to have genetic uh, modifica- modification in these ingredients, but you also have no guarantee that you are not. So those are some of the key ingredients that you've got to look out for. So you've just sent all of the listeners <laughs> <laughs> into hyper uh, overload and panic because uh, that that is in the majority of everything that we are consuming from the, for the most part uh, in a t- in a typical average American diet. So I know we're going to uh, talk about what we can do instead and what to look we'll out. We'll get there, mm-hmm. but let's first talk a little bit more about the cancer connection. And and so will you share with the exactly what is the connection of with cancer and genetically modified foods, please? Yes, and it's it it's um as I said there's not enough research yet, but bottom line, pesticides cause cancer. We know that. And these these genetically modified foods are modified to produce Pesticides. Uh, pesticides cause endocrine imbalances that are going to produce all of the hormone-dependent cancers. Um, over and over, as you heard, the researchers have observed liver and kidney toxicity. Well, if you know anything about traditional Chinese medicine, for example, they will tell you that if you have a healthy liver and, and healthy kidney function, you're not likely to get cancer. And if you don't, you don't stand a prayer against cancer. Then we have the issue of reduced nutritional value and especially phytonutrients, which help fight. At P-H-Y-T-O is the way we spell phytonutrients, which help P-H-Y-T-O cancer. Um, we have effects on the immune system. Now, we've talked about corn oil and cottonseed oil and soybean oil. Those are omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-6s suppress immune function. So the more the omega-6s, the worse your immune system is going to function. We have allergies that are being, these, these um, abnormal proteins that are being produced are causing a lot of allergies. As soon as GM soy was introduced in uh, the United Kingdom, soy allergies were reported at, up at 50% higher than usual. Uh, allergies will produce inflammation and immune system overload. That in turn is going to weaken our virus and our bacterial defenses, and that will lead to cancer susceptibility because we know that certain cancers are induced by viruses or bacterial uh, factors. So all of this contributes, and this is, this, is what we, this is what we know. It's what we don't know that I'm even more afraid of. Right. So how can the listeners learn more about your work and also about genetically hormone, genetically genetically modified modified foods? Well, certainly um, if you uh, want to go to our website, beatcancer.org, you can learn a lot about the services that we provide um, and the educational materials that we offer. You can sign up for our free e-newsletter on the website. Certainly you can also call our office if you have specific questions, 610 Six four two four eight one zero. Um, a lot of this information appears in the introduction uh, to my uh, second recipe book, Hungrier for Health. When you can go to hungryforhealth.net. Uh, and um, again, I recommend Jeffrey Smith's book, uh, Genetic Roulette. So we're talking with Susan Silverstein about her concerns regarding genetically modified foods. Uh, is it true, Susan, that animals avoid gen- genetically modified feeds? Actually, uh, that is true. If they are given a choice, and I guess that stops short of starvation, but pigs and chickens and buffalo, geese, elk, deer, raccoons, squirrels, and rats all will automatically avoid genetically modified foods. And according to the American Academy of Environmental 
environmental medicine, humans should as well. So do we have any reasons to be concerned about cross-contamination? Yes, we do. In other words, we're not just safe uh, trying to eat organic. Um, contamination happens all the time uh, by pollen and water flow in fields. It also happens in the processing uh, of uh, foods and even in the transport. Uh, they use the same rail cars for transporting uh, genetically engineered crops and non-genetically engineered cra crops. And uh, I actually saw a report from the Organic Consumers Association saying that any alfalfa growing within a five-mile radius of a genetically modified alfalfa field will immediately become contaminated. Well, that's serious. Um, I know that a lot of humans don't consistently consume a lot of alfalfa uh, daily, but alfalfa is a major food source for organic dairy cows. So if the alfalfa uh, is, organic alfalfa is contaminated, then organic milk is contaminated and organic beef goes out too. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Susan, we're – okay, so I, I, I hope we're not heading for a, a train wreck here, uh, but it, if organic seeds can't be trusted, uh, then then why are we bothering even eating organic? Yeah, and, and uh, <laughs> it's a very good question. Well, first of all, not eating is technically not an option. Um, you know, we can't abstain from all food. Um, secondly – I don't think we should be adding insult to injury. You know, if we eat as pure a diet as we possibly can, that can only help. You know, don't just throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, third of all, remember there are still a lot more toxins in animals than in plants, uh, especially because of the fatty tissue in animals. So I'm not saying you have to be a vegetarian, but you should eat a heavily plant-based diet. Get what's called organic. At least you have a fighting chance of having some pure um, products. And remember that there are still tons of phytonutrients in plants that we don't have in animal products. And so, uh, especially if they're grown in mineral-rich soil, plants can provide a lot of those health-protecting phytonutrients that can actually counteract toxins and protect our health in many, many important ways. So... When we talk about how organic foods are, are, are beneficial to us by moving to more of the, the plant-based diet, uh, even if you're, you're adding meat to your diet as well, but more focused on the plant-based diet, the right. organic plant-based diet, yeah. then... At least we're moving in the right direction. We're moving in the right direction, and it, it gives less of an opportunity for these pesticides, et cetera, to be within. Uh, right. And as T. Colin Campbell animal. stated, author of the China study, food trumps toxins every single time. That's how he stated it. In other words, the good Lord gave us one mouth, but six or seven eliminatory organs, as I often say. So, you know, we only have to get it half right. The body is programmed to deal with an awful lot of toxicity. We just have to give it a fighting chance. Right, right. So we are talking about the effects of gen genetically modified foods uh, on animals. Is there a lot of research about the health effects on genetically modified foods on humans? No. And <laughs> that's why we need to worry. As I said, it's what we don't know that I'm more concerned about than what we do know. Um, in fact, uh, there is, and this was actually um, indicated by uh, Philip Bariano, who is a University of Washington professor emeritus that is probably the world expert on um, genetically engineered foods and crops and, and the effects on both animals and humans. And 
Berriano said, you know, you have to understand what scientists mean when they use the word safe. Safe doesn't really mean safe. It means acceptable level of risk. And with genetically modified foods, there are no valid risk assessments that are being done. So uh, there's not a lot of research yet. Well, I, I have a question for you, and another question for you, and, and I have my own answer, but I would like to hear yours, because if genetically modified foods are not safe for our consumption, then tell, tell, here's the question. Wouldn't our government ban them? <laughs> it sounds good, doesn't it, Eddie? Well, um, it sounds like they should, but... It sounds like they should. All right. And um, actually, 175 countries have kind of banned them uh, under something called the precautionary principle. And, and it kind of means look before you leap. So if there's something that has potential risks and we don't know a lot about it, uh, then what we need is not to proceed with it and be rather cautious. It makes kind of logical sense. Uh, and so this biosafety protocol was signed by about 175 different countries. Uh, let's be cautious before we import genetically modified organisms into our countries. Okay, that sounds really nice. Okay, unfortunately, in the U.S., we haven't signed it, and the main reason has to do with corporate greed. The leader in the biotech industry is Monsanto. Monsanto has this ginormous pesticide uh, known as Roundup, and uh, Monsanto has actually infiltrated all of the government offices that help regulate their industry. They, they, they have a revolving door through which Monsanto's corporate officials go on their way to sitting on the board of the Food and Drug Administration uh, and other government regulatory agencies. Um, so this is very scary. And um, uh, this is conflict of interest with a, a capital C. In fact, um, the scientists uh, are only getting funded if they do what the biotech industry boards of directors want them to do. Um, and um, a lot of these scientists uh, are actually being ostracized um, if they try to uh, – you know, uh, elucidate uh, some of their findings, um, they're being ostracized. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those catch-alls that, that is constantly within our system that big corporate companies are, are able to have major influence and I don't know that you. I don't know if you've read recently. One of the other components that was brought up was about um, food dyes, which was in the news in the last, I guess, two weeks. I think uh, I did not see that, Eddie. So it was it was the aspect of that they they had done a, a number of, of research studies on food dyes uh, in our food systems, and they had come up with the that the research showed no conclusive evidence that food dyes affect our our bodies and our mm -hmm. own digestive process mm -hmm. um, and but the the take that they were making was simply that uh, the increase in uh, as we know in autism and other mm -hmm. uh, child related health issues that that they're facing. Um, there are a number of studies that are coming out that are saying that because of the type of foods that we're digesting, our children are digesting, is having these adverse health effects. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And uh, so even so if you have an scary. isolated study here and there, um, if there's 
the, there's no funding for uh, peer-reviewed studies and re replicated studies and further studies, uh, and the scientists who are trying to do it are, are, are not getting funded or maybe getting, uh, as I said, ostracized in, the, in, the, in their community, uh, there's not going to be a lot of research that is done. And unfortunately, we're going to end up with just empirical data uh, that probably in, in the next couple of decades um, uh, is going to show us the same types of responses in, in human biology that we're seeing in animal biology. Yeah. And well, all this that you've shared with us is very scary in, in that realm. And so let's talk about what we can do as health concerned consumers. Okay. First of all, we should avoid as many prepared and processed foods as possible that contain any ingredients like corn, soy, canola, or cottonseed, especially the oils of those plants. Number one, um, if you're going to buy a processed food, make sure that the ingredients are 100% USDA certified organic. Prepare your own foods from as basic ingredients as are possible. Um, and... Um, also, uh, one thing, you, one website that's really terrific, everyone should go to, it's responsibletechnology.org. That's the uh, website of the Institute for Responsible Technology, and you can learn a lot more about uh, GMOs and how to protect yourself and your family. Also, you can go to non-GMO, there's no hyphens there, it's just N-O-N-G-M-O, shoppingguide.com. And that site is really very, very helpful. And also, uh, let your retail food stores know that you are refusing to buy genetically modified foods. There is According to the Institute for Responsible Technology and the non-GMO shopping guide, there is what they call a tipping point. And if there's a large enough percentage of people who do not demand these foods, they will stop buying them. Uh, so you can learn a lot uh, more uh, from those websites. And we can make a difference as consumers um, if we kind of band together um, and uh, share this information with others. Absolutely. So I know that you've covered a, a lot of details in this, but, but share with us kind of a, as an overview. What are, what are your top ten reasons for avoiding genetically modified foods? Okay. Number one, the high levels of pesticides. Number two, the low levels of nutrients and phytonutrients in particular, which are the plant-based nutrients. Uh, number three, genetically modified foods contaminate non, or plants, crops contaminate non-genetically engineered plants and their environments. Four, they kill animals. Five, they disrupt DNA and they turn on harmful genes, and we don't even know to what extent. Uh, six, they produce foreign proteins that the body doesn't know how to process, and therefore it may have inappropriate reactions to those foreign proteins. Seven, these genetically modified organisms cannot be recalled once they've been released. We are literally opening a Pandora's box. Yes, it's already been opened to a significant extent. We don't need to open it any wider. Um, also, inadequate safety assessments. We don't even know how to judge whether they're safe or not. And if we did, uh, that information would probably get quashed by the biotech industry. Um, nine, 
It seems that these genetically modified crops are serving the interests of that industry more than the interests of humanity. And 10, maybe the most important reason, there really is no independent research on the long-term effects on human health. We just don't know what, what could be the end result here. And from what you've shared, uh, there is enough conclusive evidence that there are a number of, of effects that, um, that are occurring on animals and on the different components. So we know that those will add up um, to affect us. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, that, Susan, I know you've created two recipe books to help people prepare healthy dishes. Of course, there are no genetically modified ingredients in those books. Um, but, but tell us about your books and, and, and how we can um, really contradict the, the modified foods uh, in order to really fuel our bodies with great health and nutrition. Um, well, the two books are Hungry for Health and Hungrier for Health. Um, and I cook out of those books every night, and I literally have, if I plan a little bit, I've got dinner on the table in 15 minutes. Um, Hungry for Health is the first book, and it's got a 30-page introduction of four basic principles and 157 recipes, mostly plant-based, no cow milk, almost uh, gluten-free. Hungrier for Health, it's got a 70-page introduction, which includes a lot of the information I shared this evening, four more principles of healthy eating, and 127 recipes. Those are all vegan, 100% vegan, and 100% gluten-free. In both books, my criteria are to produce nutritionally dense recipes, um, really simple uh, to prepare easy to find ingredients, they taste great, they're gourmet quality, uh, they're family friendly, and they run the gamut from snacks and appetizers to salads, soups, main courses, uh, desserts, um, sides, and uh, juices and smoothies. So, I mean, they really cover a lot of information. And the point is that if we don't buy a lot of prepared foods, Eddie, um, we can still eat quickly and simply and tastefully. I wanted to prove to people you don't have to slave all day in your kitchen or have to shop for these really weird ingredients in order to uh, eat healthy food that tastes good. Um, in fact, most of the recipes that I've tried out where I'm slaving all day in the kitchen, they don't even taste good at the end of the day. So I'm worried about uh, prepared foods, and um, there is no soy oil in, in these books. Uh, there's no corn oil. Uh, the, the corn that is, appears in the recipes, and there aren't very many, um, I tell people, go for organic foods. Um, so uh, I think it's doable. I think people have to get away from this notion that because they're busy, and as your book says, we're all overworked, <laughs> um, and um, because uh, – People don't have a lot of leisure time, and because fast food seems to be the, the name of the game, uh, that they can't eat healthfully, they have to buy prepared foods, uh, and then therefore they're stuck with the inevitable ingredients in those prepared foods. I don't think that's true, and I'm, I really uh, believe that I have proven that in my two recipe books. So, Susan, you are... Um literally one of the, the busiest people that I know. Um, and yes. I have known that for a long time. Uh, and I know that you are a great um, manager of your time. I know that you typically do your shopping. You, you prepare ahead to do your shopping. You do your shopping. Uh, your husband, Tony, you and Tony have these great meals, um, for dinner, I, I know that you come home and you prepare them. So for our listeners, can you 
walk us through just what you do um, from the aspect of creating your grocery list, going to the grocery store, and then preparing these recipes uh, to help. Be, because here's, again, and we talked about this in our, in our last uh, teleseminar, but, it, but this is really the important, the important aspect. When we have this knowledge that genetically modified foods are dangerous to our health and that of our, our families, um, how do we really prepare? So I, I know you do this all the time. So can you share with, with us what you've learned to try to, to really cut the corners? Because when I know in my own mind, I think preparing organic, going to the store, doing all this is much more difficult than than just buying the, the processed foods and the things that we've talked about. So let's, what, what would you say to that? Um, well, uh, you're right. I am very, very busy, and um, um, and yet I, I can I can pull this off. I I use my weekends, which are also very busy, <laughs> um, to just thumb through the book. And if you have um, family that children, especially that are living with you, uh, as soon as they can uh, discuss a menu, um, get them involved with going through, start with the desserts, um, then go to the smoothies, then go to the snacks, go to the stuff that's really appealing to kids, and let them go through the book and and pick something that sounds like it's good. Um, So working with the kids, and then just kind of going through with the other members of your family and deciding uh, what you would like to make for the week. Um, And I literally uh, come up with um, a a soup, a salad, a main course, and a um, vegetable uh, for every day of the week. And then on the weekends, that's when I figure it out, and then I write down my recipe list, my, I'm sorry, my grocery list, um, based on the ingredients uh, that I'm going to need for the week. And I make my soups on the weekend um, and sometimes my stews because they do take longer than 15 minutes. Um, but everything else, and a lot of my foods are, um, they're raw, but not totally. But as long as you have a blender and a food processor, uh, you're going and a juicer. I mean, you can do so much in ten minutes, um, and, and so that's what I do. I, I actually have a little chart on my refrigerator for every day of the week, and I write only in pencil because things are going to come up and things are going to change and you may have to swap Thursday for Tuesday because you forgot to buy an ingredient or you don't have an extra 10 minutes um, because you came in late. But get them up there and just make sure that you have um, those uh, four aspects of each meal and you may find one night, um, gosh, it's too hot for soup Uh, or I think I'll swap to the cold soup tonight because it's hot out. Um, but you can do it. it. It's really not that hard. And I think another benefit, and, and I use this because I'm I'm not, I personally don't have to have uh, Monday through Friday five different entrees, or uh, I'm a little boring. I could eat the same thing for lunch every day, and I really don't care. Uh, but at, at dinner, uh, my point simply is that they they could also make the do their shopping list. Uh, go to the store on a Saturday or a Sunday, whatever they prefer. Uh, do some of the major cooking over the weekend if necessary. But there could be some of those dishes that they have on Monday and Thursday. That oh, sure. Same. Or sure. the soup could be the same or the salad could be the, the same. The soups are definitely soups. repeatable yeah. for a couple of different meals. Exactly. Same, same with the stews. Uh, same with a lot of the desserts. So, Yeah. And and I found I found Susan because we've talked about this extensively in the past, and I found other really uh, nutrition conscious uh, health advocates 
this is exactly what they say. Make your list. Know what you're going to prepare in advance. Um, go to the store, get the ingredients, and then prepare that for the week. And I also, this is really important, and I love that you, you mentioned this. Get your kids and your family involved in those decisions. What are they like? And it shifts their, um, well, I want to, you know, to have a Pop-Tart in the morning to, well, I want this great smoothie because it's easier. You can pop it in the, the processor. You, you turn on it, turn it on, and, and here's this great smoothie. Five that, seconds. That in seconds that the kids are enjoying. It's fun. It's fresh. And it energizes them as well. Uh, but it's because you've gotten them involved in that decision process and they're starting to eat um, from the recipes, from the healthy decisions that, that you're helping and you're encouraging them to take. Mm-hmm. So share with, uh, sure, how can our listeners get your books? Um, and by the way, um, if you have someone special in your life, um, it's, it's a great gift for Mother's Day or birthday or, uh, uh, you know, Christmas or any, any time when there's a special occasion. These books make great gifts. So first of all, they can be ordered toll free uh, by phone, 888-551-2223. Uh, you can also go to HungryForHealth.net, and you can find the first book, the Hungrier for Health book, and even the Hungry for Health snack bars. And by the way, the profits support all of the cancer education services of the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education. And how can people with cancer concerns, because you just touched on this, that that they themselves have concerned with cancer, learn about your patient services and the other services that the center offers. Uh, If you go to our website, beatcancer.org, the home page has a link uh, to uh, the individualized one-on-one telephone coaching services that we offer nationwide. Um, And then there are also a lot of the other special initiatives, our college campus outreach initiative, our minority outreach programs, our specialized breast cancer programs. Uh, That's the best way to get an overview of all of the types of services that the center provides. And then, of course, uh, you are more than welcome to call our office at 610-642-4810 for additional uh, information. We do this patient coaching nationwide by telephone. I mean, you don't even have to donate if you can't afford it. And if you can afford it, please donate to help underwrite the services that we offer to those who cannot uh, make a donation themselves but are who are in great need. Susan, give the office number one more time. 610-642-4810. One zero, and the Susan just said this, but I, I want to re- reiterate that the center never turns away anyone in need, uh, and is they true. provide amazing services to those individuals who are in need. and And it's great that listeners and and others can help the center to touch other people's lives um, who maybe not be able. To afford making a contribution or a donation, so it's always important for donations to come into the center. So, Susan, I know that you work with people nationwide. Um, how can our listeners get more involved in the organization and uh, your work? Um, thanks for asking that, Eddie. Because the truth is, we do reach out nationwide, and people who are not located in the Philadelphia area can also help us. Uh, there's so many opportunities to get involved um, wherever you live. Uh, first of all, you can subscribe to our free e-newsletter, um, and if you go to the homepage, you'll see. Um, ways to get involved. Um, You can make a donation, as we mentioned. You can host um, a um, race for case. Uh, 
um, which is any kind of athletic event that you want to host, and we can teach you how to tie it to a fundraiser without your having to collect money from people. Um, you can become a corporate sponsor or find us a corporate sponsor. Uh, we hope people will share their stories. There's a link from the home page. We have an Apples for Prevention campaign that is suitable for any business anywhere in the country. Um, you can also schedule a lecture in your area. And I was speaking to someone today from North Jersey who would like to do that. Um, you can be a networker. You can help us with social media uh, communication, which you, you can never do too much of that. And so there are lots and lots of ways to become involved other than just needing our services yourself or for someone in your family. So, Susan, you've talked uh, about a number of great resources from your two cookbooks, uh, which people can find more about it at bcancer.org. You've also given the uh, reasonabletechnology.org uh, website and the non-GMO shoppingguide.com website. Yeah, responsible as, technology. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, responsible technology mm -hmm. uh, dot org. Dot org. Non-GMO shoppingguide.com uh, as two great resources as well. Can you? Just as a wrap up, uh, you know, what are your last minute advice? What is your last minute advice to the listeners on making this shift uh, to be more conscious about what they're purchasing in the stores uh, with genetically modified foods and moving to more uh, all natural and healthy foods and the way in which they cook? And any other, any last minute thoughts? Well, I think the best advice is to be kind to yourself. Uh, don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, when you want to take responsibility for your health, uh, spell it responsibility and not the typical way because the typical concept of responsibility is uh, laying blame. It's your fault if you're not well. It's your fault if you got sick. It's your fault if you can't get better. And that just produces guilt, which in my mind is more carcinogenic than any genetically modified organisms out there. Um, so I think the idea is to take one step at a time, choose your battle, whether it's the microwaving battle from last month that we discussed or it's it's uh, cutting out soy oil or it's uh, buying more plants or buying a recipe book or, you know, uh, making a healthy dessert, uh, choose your battle and work that until it becomes part of your daily life and kind of who you are and the routines in, in your home and in your kitchen, and then go on to the next battle, whether it takes you a few days or a few weeks or even a few months to master, one step at a time, and then keep moving forward. I've been climbing my nutritional ladder for over 30 years, and every time I think I've gotten to the top rung, I learn something new and learn there are more rungs to climb. And every step you make, pat yourself on the back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Susan, it's always a pleasure to have this conversation with you about um, great nutrition and, and improving our own lifestyles through nutritional choices. And I just encourage everyone uh, to get your other teleseminars and and information from BeCancer.org and call the center for assistance if, if there's someone that they love uh, that one of your wonderful counselors can be of a service to them uh, and make a, a contribution to the center and, and keep uh, providing those services to those other individuals who, who may not be able to afford the service themselves. But through kind contributions, they can. So uh, I appreciate you being with us this evening and Thank you, sharing Eddie. all of your knowledge. And I would just remind people, too, as a bonus tonight, if you'd like six chapters of my new book, uh, Living Inside Out, the go-to guide for the overwhelmed, overworked, and overcommitted, you can go to eddiemiller.com. I'm the first customer for that one, Eddie. Uh, and download them <laughs> uh, free of charge. Uh, and and yeah, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. 
So, Susan, have a great evening. Everyone have a great evening. And until the next one. Thank you, Eddie. All right. Good night. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beat Cancer Answer. If you learned just one thing today about how to prevent, cope with, or beat cancer, then we have succeeded in our mission. For more information or assistance, visit our website at beatcancer.org. Remember to sign up for our educational email series and get your free gift. Join in the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, or Google+, where you can meet others who think just like you. We appreciate all of your feedback and love your suggestions. Please also remember to rate us on iTunes. Your positive ratings help us to get discovered so we can save more lives. Thank you again for listening, and best wishes for good health from all of us at BeatCancer.org.